Okay, is that better for everybody? I wasn't able to switch my microphone to my Yeti mic or to my Logitech Brio camera. And uh, I hope everybody can hear this a lot better and there's no echo and the camera's better for you guys. Uh, let me know in the chat. Uh, all right, well, anyway, uh, it's right now midnight here in uh, Colorado, but uh, occasionally I do AMAs late at night because uh, apparently there's places in the world other than the United States. And in those places, sometimes it's daytime when it's nighttime here. Uh, so I, uh, I bite the bullet and I try to get a little bit of a nap in so that I can talk to you guys too, because I love you guys as much as everyone else. A uh, few things. Uh, one, I wanted to give an update of where we're at with Ledger and uh, where we are at with uh, Shelley, and then open it up for questions. Uh, so in terms of Ledger, uh, things are moving along quite well. Uh, what happened was that there needed to be pretty considerable update uh, to the software that was going on the Ledger. So we worked with a third-party company called Vacuum Labs, and uh, Vacuum Labs uh, has finished their package of work, and now Ledger and um, uh, Emergo are working real hard at trying to get Euroi support, and uh, they think that there's a pretty good possibility, not 100%, but very good like greater than 50%, uh, that they should be able to get that out in the month of March. So in just a few weeks, uh, if you guys have Ledger devices, Ledger Nanos, you should be able to use those Ledgers in Euroi. Um, Euroi has really been a phenomenal success. I'm super, super happy with the speed at which they're developing features and uh, the acceleration that they're gaining and the product quality still looks pretty good. Uh, there's still some issues here and there. Uh, mobile clients aren't where they quite need to be, uh, but the, the code is is quite nice to work with, and uh, it's nice to see that Emergo is able to really help a lot of people out and get to accessibility to the next level. So uh, Ledger probably coming in March, very good possibility of that. We're a little bit behind them because we're in the middle of a massive update, and we have to kind of clear that update first, and then we can start building features and functionality like uh, Ledger Multisig. Uh, but it, for me, it's really important that at least uh, one of the Cardano wallets does support Ledger because then that means if you have a Ledger device, then you can use that wallet as the interface. And it really doesn't matter with the security model because at the end of the day, your wallet is an interface to talk to the Ledger device, but the private keys live on that device. So whether you interface through Euroi or you interface through Daedalus, it doesn't change your security reality. And I would argue probably it's better to use a web interface like um, Euroi uh, because it has a faster user experience. It just boots really quickly and it's really easy to install Euroi uh, and manage these things. So it's, uh, you know, until we get light clients for Daedalus, um, that's probably the way to go. Uh, so uh, that's the story there. Now, in terms of Shelly, uh, the milestone for Shelly, really there are, there are kind of three buckets of work that we do. And each of those buckets has to be done for Shelly to begin. Uh, so Byron was launched in uh, September of 2017. Uh, late September, and uh, now we are reaching the end of life of Byron. So the last major update to Byron uh, was 1.4, and the first update to begin the Shelly era for our current code base in market is uh, 1.5. So uh, 1.5 is the OBFT update. Uh, it's been in QA hell for a bit uh, because the Seracel code's been so difficult to work with, uh, but the good news is it's starting to work its way through that at a faster pace. Uh, so a uh, very strong possibility that 1.5 will ship uh, before the end of March. There could be some factors like regressions or other little things that we discover, but those are unlikely. Um, the code is feature complete, and now it's just a matter of making sure that it passes all of our QA tests. When you do a consensus upgrade, that's a rather significant event for your system, uh, but uh, this particular protocol is much simpler than Orbor's Genesis, so uh, it means that the testing can be done more quickly. Uh, so 1.5 is on its way. Uh, look for that. Uh, you can kind of watch it work its way through QA uh, if, you, if you are clever about how our commits work. And uh, we'll let you guys know uh, when and how that's, uh, that's going to come out. Now, when we ship it, it's not going to provoke a hard fork immediately uh, because we need to give partners time to upgrade. Um, some exchanges are still on... 1.3.1 and have not even updated to 1.4, uh, 
Uh, and uh, Yoroi is back end is still based on a heavily modified version of 1.2. So we're working with them to try to get them upgraded because in addition to the OBFT update, 1.5 also is going to fully deprecate the V0 APIs. Uh, so if you've implemented exchange goes away, uh, you know, you're going to have to redo your implementation to, uh, uh, to get your exchange to work properly with the wallet backend. So we're in discussions with all the exchanges that uh, hold Cardano and um, they send us messages and we're working our way through that. So 1.5 is really the first major step in Shelly. And then there's going to be a series of updates that come quickly. And each and every one of them will be rolling in new features and new functionality. Uh, second, uh, we've been working really hard at finalizing the candidate specifications for Shelley. So while code is nice, uh, at the end of the day, if this is a truly decentralized ecosystem, then any person, regardless of who they are, uh, should have the ability to look at a series of documentation specification, which is independent of a particular philosophy, and it just has, it's, it's written in math or TLA or, or some language, they should be able to take that and write their own client. We did this with Ethereum Classic and actually Ethereum with the Mantis client. We did not talk to the Ethereum Foundation. We didn't ask for permission. We didn't have to get, get right access to their GitHub or something like that. We just took the yellow paper, uh, the documentation of Ethereum, and from that documentation, we were able to build a Scala client from scratch, 15,000 lines of code. Uh, it took a while, but we did it, and that client was able to talk to the Geth nodes and the parity nodes and other nodes in the system. So if Cardano was to achieve this same level of uh, quality in terms of specification documentation, our specs do need to be complete. Uh, so uh, the Berlin Delegation Summit that we had in January was a very good event. It was a very rigorous event. There were a lot of conversations that took quite a bit of time. Uh, and working our way through that event, we discovered there were a lot of little small details in the specifications uh, that needed to be slightly changed here and there and cleaned. But what we've been able to do is mostly resolve that. And uh, now we're in the process of taking the implementations that we've done for Boris Prowse and Genesis and then deriving specifications from those implementations and uh, from the paper to make sure both sides agree. We actually have two independent implementations of those protocols. One is uh, on the Rust side and one's on the Haskell side. And there's a bit of a drift between those two. So there's going to have to be a reconciliation that's uh, that's done, and uh, that reconciliation will happen in the ensuing weeks. Uh, so our goal is to have all the candidate specifications for Cardano done uh, be, for Shelly uh, done before the end of Q1. That might slip a little bit, but uh, we're almost there. Uh, it technically you don't need specifications done to ship a product like Shelly, but what that effectively means is that there are parts of your protocol or your cryptocurrency, and this is quite common. Uh, most of cryptocurrencies from Bitcoin to Ethereum have things that are off spec. You don't need to have a specification done to ship the product. It's just if you do that, uh, then that means you're basically saying the code is the specification. For example, when runtime verification worked with uh, on the KEVM project, they found out that the yellow paper was not a complete specification of the design of the Ethereum virtual machine. So they actually had to look at the implementation of it and look at how Solidity worked and other things to kind of backward engineer exactly how the Ethereum virtual machine works and to create a complete set of formal semantics for it. Uh, so we'll be in a similar situation and a little bit in the beginning and certain things are off spec. Uh, they're still high quality and they're written with good coding practices and standards. It's just that we don't have three to six months to sit down and academically argue uh, about very fine details. What we can do is we can backfill things. And because we have two clients that have to converge, uh, we'll do that through a specification driven process at a later date. Uh, so the formal methods team is working pretty quickly and we should have a complete set of candidate specs either by the end of this quarter or by the middle of next quarter. Uh, and then a convergence of specifications between the two clients. And, and then there's gonna be a period of reconciliation there. Um, a few things, uh, we're also going to do some Gogan related specification at the same time because it's low hanging fruit. So we're gonna create a specification for extended UTXO and also for multi-asset accounting, which means that uh, those are the asset issuance. So our, our variant of ERC-20. 
Uh, and then there's a few other little things like the sidechain specification, which will come as well, which is a prerequisite for Gogan. But we also want to get it out the door because the sidechains model also gives us super efficient light clients. Uh, so, uh, so that's where we're at in terms of second bucket specification. And we're moving pretty quickly. Uh, the third thing is uh, basically the when can I stake? So sh when we say Shelly, we say staking. That's the most common notion, and that's an accurate notion. So staking always begins first on a test net uh, because a lot can go wrong. <laughs> so you want to make sure that people actually know what they're doing uh, and people understand the mechanics. And also we have to set a lot of parameters. And so we have an idea. And if you read our specifications uh, right now under the GitHub repo and at some point, we'll just push some PDFs if people don't want to build the LaTeX. If you read the specs, we have a candidate set of parameterizations, everything from the rewards to give to uh, the incentives to try to accumulate how many stake pools, whether it'll be 100 or 1,000, 10,000, these types of things. Uh, and so it's really important that we get some feedback. And it's a two-way conversation between us and the community so that we can find a nice set of candidate uh, parameters for the system. Because at the end of the day, the theory says it's secure whether you pick X or Y or Z. X, Y, or Z is an economic and community preference. Uh, so you establish that economic and community preference uh, through the uh, through the testnet phase. So uh, we have the Haskell team working really hard to get to a testnet, and we have the Rust team working really hard to get to a testnet. Now, the Rust team, they have a true hacker mentality. Uh, so they asked me a few weeks ago if I could fly every single one of them out to Hong Kong and they could have like a month-long brutal codathon boot camp uh, where they just go ahead and work like hell and not sleep and try to get everything to, to work the way they want. Uh, so I said, well, if you can find me an office space you can go to, then I'll consider it. So uh, Emergo Hong Kong was gracious enough to actually lend their office space to our Rust team. Uh, so I said, all right. And they flew from France and England and other places and uh, all went to uh, Hong Kong. So now the entire Rust team is uh, sitting in Hong Kong working basically nonstop. Uh, and their goal is to try to converge to uh, get all the features finished for a, uh, for a test net as quickly as possible. Uh, so as we get towards the end of February, uh, we'll get more updates for you on exactly when that test net's going to land. Uh, but to me, it's a very high priority to get that test net out in Q1. And at that point, we are in the Shelley era because we'll have specs, that's one bucket, We'll have the first of a series of hard forks enabled, and at some point we flip the uh, switch, and staking has begun. In addition to that, you need people to stake, so we launched the stake pool task force. Uh, there were about 1,300 people who signed up, and then we went to the old list that was uh, sent out last year in April, and there were a few thousand people on that, and uh, we got them all into a communication channel, and um, they're asking questions. I think we have a few hundred questions so far that have accumulated. So basically, uh, we're creating a structured process for people to ask questions. Uh, anybody in can join this group. Anybody can ask questions within this group. They all go to a repo, and then somebody's job is to go through, filter all of them, you know, combine duplicate questions and uh, or restate questions in a way that are you know, a little bit easier for us to parse and answer, especially given that many people don't speak English as a first language, and some questions do come in in different languages, and they need to be translated. Uh, once that's done, then it goes to us, Duncan, Bruno, myself, Agalos, and other people. We answer those questions, and we write all those answers down. We give them to the group. And then they say, well, that's interesting, but your answers give us more questions. We repeat the process, and the goal is to do it a few times until we have a huge corpus of information. Now, I've got some questions of why are we doing this? What was the point of, uh, of, writing, of this Q&A process? Well, it's because I've noticed repeatedly on Twitter, Reddit, uh, that people don't really understand how Warhorse works, how staking works, or even basic mechanics of what we're proposing. For example, there's this impression that you have to freeze your ADA uh, to, to stake, and that as long as you're doing that, your ADA is locked and you can't go do something with it. Uh, that's not entirely true, and that's a, something that people believe because of things that Casper has been proposing. And we're, we're not Casper and we have nothing to do with their protocol. So instead of just answering the same question over and over and over and over, uh, what we've decided to do is just say, let them all ask us at once. We'll get it all into material. And once we have that, then we can create a FAQ and we can create content around that, blog post videos and other things. So when you in the community see somebody ask about this, instead of trying to answer it, you can just point them with a link and say, this answers everything. And if 
they say, oh, I don't want to read that. They say, well, <laughs> then you don't deserve an answer. Uh, also, we talked to the Clio guys, the guys who did the uh, Marcus and Robert, uh, the guys who did the first uh, Plutus course, uh, training course, and we asked them to assist us in parsing the questions. And once they've parsed, uh, basically taking our answers and creating educational material based on that. So we will create educational material. Uh, the Cardano Foundation will create some educational material and some third party community people will as well. Now, after we have, uh, we've uh, done this whole stake pool thing uh, and we have this huge pool of people that are really excited and interesting, some subset of them will be fairly technically capable. And that is the perfect set of people to take and plop right into uh, the Shelly testnet. Uh, then instead of just launching a testnet, you have launched a testnet with people who actually care about a testnet and understand what you're trying to accomplish. And then we can begin systematic stress testing. Uh, and go through many different scenarios in our risk register and verify that the theoretical guarantees of the protocol actually match reality. Uh, so for example, if you have 101 uh, people doing something, make 50 of them malicious and 51 honest, and let's just verify that the protocol still runs. It should, because that's a theoretical guarantee. Uh, and if it doesn't, then something's wrong in the implementation. We don't think there's something wrong, but it's really nice to run these scenarios as a sanity check, because then it tells us and objective third-party people that we've actually achieved what we've wanted. Uh, so that's where we're at, a huge hackathon, and things are moving really quickly on the Rust side. Uh, we're kind of priming the pool and getting a large group of people to flood into the uh, Shelley testnet, and these will be sophisticated people. So once they leave this process, there'll be a lot of surrogacy, and they can actually start building communities and answering questions, and many, many, many people are very excited about that. And then hopefully we can have a very short time period to move over into um, Shelley. Um, on the Haskell side, things are still moving in a pretty good direction. Uh, we have a lot of very refined and elegant ideas uh, that uh, the Haskellers have been working on. And uh, what we're trying to do is figure out how do we get those ideas into realistic and reasonable timelines. Uh, so we did a little bit of shuffling at IOHK to try to speed things up and to make processes run better. So at the moment, our company's most effective and efficient engineering group is actually has nothing to do with uh, cryptocurrency. It has everything to do with blockchain. That's our enterprise work group led by Bruno Paleo. Uh, Bruno has never missed a deadline. He's always delivered under budget and ahead of schedule. And uh, they actually have about a four to six week release cycle. And they've been building an enterprise framework in Scala. Uh, so uh, the work they're doing there is just top-notch, and we're almost in a position where we're just about ready to begin pilots in Ethiopia and other places using that enterprise framework, which we consider to be a great gateway drug to get people into the Cardano ecosystem. Because once you get them into a blockchain system, they have wallets and identities, and you can use that to connect it via our protocols to a cryptocurrency. And, of course, the one we'll connect it to is Cardano, because that's the one I care about, uh, not Ethereum. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, that group has just done phenomenal work. I love the fact that every four weeks they release something and usually pretty good and uh, they're fairly bug free and it's a highly motivated team. So uh, what we decided to do is move Bruno into a leadership role with IOHK. So uh, we promoted him to be our director of engineering and we moved Duncan into a lead technical architect role where he can do the things that he does best, which is worry about the architecture and the design of the system and less about the day-to-day -day processes of how to manage engineers and uh, also how to think about software methodology in terms of, you know, how do we release, how do we do QA, and how do we manage uh, basically getting ourselves into a reasonable release cycle. Uh, I'm unhappy with how long it takes to go from 1.3, 1.4, and so forth. Some of this has to do with inherited technical debt, and some of this has to do with just bad processes that were really not well thought out from prior management, and in some cases myself. Uh, so the good news is that Bruno is now on board, and uh, he's a computational logician. He got his PhD in two years, good H index. Uh, so he's both an academic and a formal methods expert, but he's a really, really good programmer as well. Originally from Brazil, but he does live in Australia. Uh, and uh, he's worked with our company for well over a year, and he's done just great work. So uh, we also hired David Esser, uh, and David's job is to be a product manager. So what he does is uh, he sits down every day and worries about user experience. Uh, he worries about bugs. In fact, one of the first things that he did is he talked to the guys at the help desk and he said, send me all the bug reports. <laughs> we said, are you sure about that? Because there's, 
there's a lot of tickets we get. And he said, I want to see them. I want to drink from the fire hose. Uh, so he worries a lot about that. David flew out to my ranch here in Colorado and spent a week with us. And uh, we, uh, we've been giving David, Jeremy and I, a huge amount of information about Cardano. So um, he's going to be worried a lot about basically getting the rest test net where it needs to go and working with Bruno to get the uh, Haskell team into a ship ready delivery culture, but preserve the rigor and uh, preserve the really cool ideas they have. And also make sure that we do proper reconciliation. This frees me up to do things like build partnerships. Uh, and it frees me up also to think about uh, bigger, more significant features to the system, especially as we begin entering the Gogan era and later eras, which will include uh, governance features and so forth, which are coming faster than you'd think. And we have to begin doing work now uh, if we uh, if we want to ship them in a reasonable period of time. So that's where we're at. Uh, Shelly is staking. Staking is coming soon. Uh, either it's going to be on the Rust side or the Haskell side. More likely than not, the first test net will be Rust. Uh, we'll ha we're right now priming a large group of people to participate. Anybody can, uh, but uh, we'd like to at least have some uh, fairly good uh, participants. Uh, the specs are entering candidate phase. Uh, there's some cases we'll have multiple specifications, like on the network stack. We're actually probably going to have three candidate specifications, one from the Rust, one that's being built on the enterprise side, which could be potentially reused in uh, Cardano, and then what the network team has been doing on the Haskell side, which is about 50 60% done, give or take, May maybe a little bit more. But um, they're converging to a final design, which has some really cool features about it, but it's implemented with dependent types and there's a little bit of complexity there. So we have to kind of work our way through it and get our spec to where it needs to be. Okay, so I'll shut up now. That's uh, that's your update. Uh, now let's get to your questions. <clears throat> Aloha, Darcy. D is that the Darcy from... Uh, from uh, the hotel in uh, Lahaina. Okay, let's see here. Some of the questions you guys have. Yeah, that's a good question from CH about Windows input. Uh, until the rest of all uh, ends, uh, cross-platform compatibility is an open question for the first generation. I suspect we will deploy to Windows, Mac, and uh, Windows, but it's more of a DevOps question. And we have to wait for the software to reach a certain level of maturity before we get to the process of building things. My preference would be to have a turnkey Docker image that we deploy. But it may be that the first generation is a Linux um, push, and that's followed by a, um, a Windows and a Mac effort. Because you have to remember that it's a different user class when you're talking about a stake pool in particular. Um, the user client is fine, and it's going to be a command line interface, the first client on the, state, on, the, on the test net. But when you're talking about a stake pool, there's a high probability that people are just going to be deploying to something like Amazon Web Services or Azure, and they'll be dealing with a Linux server. Um, and if that's the case, then it matters a little bit less about Windows interoperability there. Uh, the preferred environment for uh, servers generally is Linux. Uh, but remember, that's for stake pools, not for shelly consumer clients. We're, of course, going to have a Windows, Mac, uh, Linux, and uh, mobile client interoperability there. Now, I see this one a lot, too. Will IXK extend Cardano contract beyond 2020? <laughs> We don't extend contract clients has more to do more work, but there's a scope of work with Cardano and that scope of work will get done even if it takes additional time to do it. <clears throat> but I think we have a good chance of hitting all those milestones um, because you know the front part was heavy research and we're now exiting heavy research and going to a hardcore implementation. And we kind of had to learn how to do that the way it needed to be done. And we're now converging as a company to being able to do um, really fast software development. So I think 2020, the end of 2020 is a reasonable deadline for everything that was uh, what we were planning for that first generation. Um, we need a treasury system. 
not just for us, but for everyone in the ecosystem uh, who want to do things. Like, I don't want a situation where the Cardano Foundation has to somehow find a way to sustain itself so that it can continue giving grants to Clio or Tangem or other people. I want a situation where if you have a cool idea, uh, you just go to the treasury, you submit a ballot, and you go and make the case to the community directly. And then there's a democratic process upon which people approve or reject that, and that there's dedicated money for these people. And if we get to that, then we're a very sustainable ecosystem because you don't have gatekeepers. The minute that you have somebody who decides at the top, that person's your king. Uh, it's the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. Uh, so we're not going to stop till that treasury is done at the very least. And uh, if there's still more work to do, then uh, and we're not funded for that, then we'll submit a treasury ballot. But I don't think uh, it'll take that. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, actually, uh, Nishant, uh, the H index, the highest H index uh, in our company, I think, is 75. And that's from Phil Wadler. He's written, he has 25,000 citations. All right, let's see what else we got here. Do, do, do. Charles, is there any other way to make Daedalus Wallet download a little faster than how it is now? You know, it's interesting. I, I I've, can download the wallet very quickly from Amazon because that's where we host it. Uh, but for certain groups of people, uh, the wallet binaries, they download fairly slowly, like in several megabyte bits per second. Uh, and I'm not sure why that is. I've talked to my DevOps people and they're starting to look into that. Um, but then you might also be referring to how long it takes to download the blockchain. Uh, when the new network stack comes in, uh, the blockchain will download much faster because instead of being shipped from just a relay, you'll have multiple relays and a peer-to-peer -peer model. And uh, then it'll ship kind of like a torrent in that case. Uh, but your mileage may vary. It depends on your ISP, your geography, your network configuration, uh, and a lot of things can influence the rate at which a blockchain downloads. Ideally, we'd like to get to a world where you do not have to download the entire blockchain to be an effective network participant and to enjoy a reasonable level of security and not have to trust a third party. Now, uh, there is a arms race right now in the cryptocurrency space of how do we get the next generation like client? And so you're seeing technology like Algorand recently proposed a paper called Vault. Uh, it's a very well-written paper. And the long and the short is that you don't have to possess the entire blockchain or UTXO to be able to use the system. Uh, and you'd still be able to verify that what you're looking at is, is secure as if you had the entire blockchain. There's also another proposal out of MIT called UTREEXO, U-T-R-E-E-X-O. And uh, it's a somewhat similar idea where they're pushing some of the work to the uh, client, but you don't have to store or use uh, the entire UTXO to get your security. Um, we're also looking at taking our sidechains paper, the proof of stake sidechains paper, and saying, look, we can take the UTXO, we can take the Merkle root of the UTXO. So you put in every little leaf one of the entries, and then it builds its way up to a Merkle root, and you have that little thing. And then maybe every 10 blocks or 100 blocks, uh, we put it in the header. Uh, and then uh, basically what you would do is you would retrieve the most current UTXO, you retrieve the nearest header uh, block, and then just get the chain back to that. And then you would verify that that UTXO matches the checkpoint. But then how do you know that that point is right? Well, you'd know it's right if you use the TMS construction that we have in the proof of stake paper. So those TMS signatures will be embedded periodically throughout the chain, epic by epic. And you just recursively walk your way back to the Genesis block, which is hard coded into every client. So in reality, the total amount of data you need to download would only be a few megabytes. Uh, potentially, and then you would still be able to verify that that UTXO you received is correct, which means that you can instantly start working. You won't necessarily have your transaction history, uh, but what it means is that I can have a light mode with Daedalus and make that the default mode. So when you install Daedalus, you download a small snippet of things, and boom, your client just starts working. It's just like your Roy in that respect. And then as a background process, it gradually upgrades itself to a full wallet, but it doesn't stop you from using your client. It also means that we could start having meaningful discussions about fast bootstrapping for recovery and these things without relying on a third party explorer or other infrastructure. So we're working on that. And Macaulay at Algorand is working on his thing and MIT's got their thing and the uh, guys over at Unity have their thing. In fact, that we invited all of them to come down to the IOHK Summit 
uh, and there's going to be some good people there. Uh, and uh, we'll talk to them about their best available process. But they're writing papers, we're writing papers, and uh, there's going to be a grand convergence of these things. What does it mean for you, the consumer? It means that you're not going to have to ever do what I had to do when I joined the space, uh, which is download a Kluge client, wait a really, really long time for the chain to propagate, uh, to fully download, and then, uh, then use it. Instead, you're just going to download it and use it like you do a cell phone app, and then you wake up one day and your client happens to be more useful than it was before, but you didn't have to wait for that. It just organically kind of happened. Okay. Let's see what we got here. What will happen to Cardano coins that get lost via lost keys and the like? Well, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto had an opinion on that. He said that um, that's like a little gift to everybody in the Bitcoin ecosystem whenever anybody loses their coins. Um, and that was 2009, 2010 thinking on Bitcoin talk when the stakes were quite low. It is a bit disturbing when you say, hey, we have a global financial system and this global financial system is going to... Uh, replace the dollar or be an alternative financial operating system for the entire world. But then there is no recovery model when something like, for example, the CEO of an exchange dies and uh, his private keys are lost with them. Uh, or what happens when you have inheritance situations? Uh, you know, when grandma dies, uh, you know, and she's the last living member, well, how do you actually give her crypto to the kids? Uh, you know, what's that process if she never wrote her keys down or they got lost in a fire or something like that. Uh, we live in the real world, and when these things happen, we have meat space human processes uh, to transition and move funds that have been lost or remediate from theft or, or so forth. But in the crypto world, we don't quite have that. So there's two schools of thought. One school of thought says that you put a governance layer in your system, and then if there's an issue, you go to the governance layer with some evidence, and you say, governance layer... Uh, I have this evidence, and as a consequence, uh, you can clearly see that what happened was not what we intended, a la Dow. And uh, there's another school of thought that says, buyer beware, and if it happens, code is law, and you're just going to have to deal with the consequences of that. And I say in a certain respect, both are right. And actually, I think in a certain respect, both of these things can actually live together in one ledger. And how you do that is you say, look, we're going to have differentiation on the address level and on the smart contract level for storage and use of funds. So basically what you do is you say, I consent to having my funds controlled by a governance system uh, or having some sort of restoration process in the event that I get hacked or an issue occurs. So I'm going to move my funds to a specially constructed address or to a smart contract that has a bunch of logic that basically allows those funds to be redistributed, allows the private keys to move from one set to another set, whatever you want. So there's logic within there. And this is the magic of smart contracts that lets you do that. And then we can have an argument as a community of, well, uh, what are the best practices we should have? But here's the thing, whatever we implement is voluntary. So you get to decide whether you consent to that kind of a system and if you don't like it, there can be a competing system. For example, in finance, there's Islamic finance, and there's more than a billion people that uh, that need Sharia-compliant uh, uh, investment products, and they can't participate in certain forms of investment or financial practices out of religious respect. Uh, so, and there's also uh, funds that can't invest in uh, certain things because of. Uh, ethical reasons. For example, Norway has one of the world's largest sovereign funds, well over a trillion dollars of money. And Norway puts very strict uh, ethical guidelines on what they can invest their sovereign fund in. Uh, and if you happen to be doing those things, even if you're a great investment, the country of Norway won't give you money. Uh, so similarly, you can vote with your values and move your funds to an address, to a smart contract that carries those particular values. So that's the magic of where we're going with these things. Uh, we will build some of them, and then we can leave it to third parties to build the rest. Now, some people say that you, you shouldn't even 
allow this to be voluntary, you should have such a pervasive governance system that the ledger can do things like reverse transactions, reissue money, create new money. Uh, for example, the Tezos governance system conceivably could allow you to uh, create new money, blacklist old money, and EOS has actually already reversed transactions. I do not think that that's ethical or wise. Uh, we haven't resolved in any shape or form uh, the governance problems of the United States or Europe or the rest of the world. So why are we to believe that uh, somehow we're so much smarter that when hundreds of millions of people in aggregate can't quite get a government to work properly, that some hackers in their basement are going to just dream up the perfect governance system that will then be permanently in a plutocracy or an oligarchy, and this is a committee not as subject to any particular jurisdiction's laws. It's like a meta-government. So you have no recourse or no appeal. Uh, so I think that's a really, really, really bad idea. And uh, honestly, I feel that um, it's much better to make these things voluntary and then for us to argue about what's the best way of implementing them. And then once you've consented to something, both parties agree that that's fine. What does this mean? It means that Every now and then, grandma makes a mistake. Every now and then, an exchange makes a mistake. And in which case, you've reduced the total supply of the system, which is a gift to everybody. So at the very least, your mistake, in a way, helped other people get a little bit more value. And it helped everybody get a little wiser. And I frankly feel that you need consequences and a cost uh, for an action for it to be meaningful. If you always know that you have an insurance policy that no matter what you do, you can get bailed out, you start behaving as if there are no consequences to the way you do things. For example, with Wall Street, when Greenspan gave them a put, and he said, hey, I'll always make the stock go up, or later central bank leadership that allowed the mortgage crisis to exacerbate to a point of crisis, and the banks didn't really care because they said, well, you know, we'll make the windfall profits today, and if the system collapses, we'll get bailed out, and nice retirement packages. You have to create consequences uh, for a feedback loop to organically improve. If Apple releases a crummy phone or Samsung releases a phone that explodes, they get sued and they have bad press. They lose lots of sales, billions of dollars. So as a consequence, they have to put in good processes to avoid these types of things from happening. If they said, well, if I release a crappy phone, the Korean government's just going to give us a subsidy to make up for the lost profits or the U.S. government's just going to bail us out, well, then do they particularly care if the phone is good or bad? Not so much. And that's why certain systems like the education system, the healthcare system in the United States are so horribly broken because they've disintermediated the consumer and their purchasing behavior from the quality of the product and the outcome of the product. The third parties generally pay, either via student loans or insurance. So they can just increase the cost, reduce the quality, make worse outcomes, and we're at loggerheads. Ticket prices from Raul. Uh, he asked about discounted tickets for the summit. Uh, yes, there will be a discount if you buy with ADA. ADA pays almost done. Uh, we're working with ATIX on that. Uh, they're basically building an interface. We're using Eventbrite for our ticketing system. So we're building an extension to Eventbrite that allows us to uh, basically accept ADA payment. Uh, it just takes a little bit of time to do that because the systems were not designed to talk to each other. Uh, so we've been building it for the last month. And uh, that's almost done. And once it's done, uh, we'll be able to accept ADA payments for the uh, for the tickets and use the uh, singular system for ticketing. There's an advantage to not having parallel systems because it's a huge logistic overhead if you have parallel systems because, you know, you'll have one big piece of automation that Eventbrite provides, and that's super turnkey and easy, but then you have these other tickets. So what that would effectively mean is anybody who bought a ticket with ADA would show up and say, hey, I bought a ticket. And then we say, oh, you're one of those ADA people. You have to go to that box over there. And we'd have to have like a different line or something. And I would much rather everybody's in one process and one system. So that meant we had to build a bridge. And so the bridge is nearly done. And once it's done, uh, we'll accept it. Uh, it should be the 18th, but maybe a day or two, but I don't think it'll slip too much. Uh, but it, we're pretty much on target for that. And uh, the uh, the system will let you buy a ticket pretty easily, uh, and ADA tickets will be discounted. I think it's 15% or 20%. I'll have to talk to Kerry. But it's a nice discount uh, as a sign of appreciation to our ADA holders. Um, now, uh, I've gotten a little bit of pushback on the ticket prices. Uh, if you go to the 
consensus uh, event that CoinDesk is putting on. The early bird prices are $1,200. Uh, and uh, I've been to well over 30 conferences last year, uh, actually 58 events last year. Not all of them were conferences, but I've seen ticket prices from $100 to $4,000 a ticket. And I feel that the prices that we're charging are fairly reasonable. Now, it's important to point out that we are not planning on making a profit from this conference. Uh, the reason why we're selling tickets is that we f are flying out every single IOHK employee, and in many cases, family members, and uh, we renting a big venue, and we're providing a lot of value. And the cost of doing this is the minimum of a million dollars for us. So the hope of the tickets is to recoup the, the cost of bringing all of our people together. We also are getting very good speakers to come in addition. So a lot of great academics have already RSVP'd and they'll be there for panels, including some of our competitors, and they'll be able to go there and make the case why their protocols are better than our protocols. Uh, and uh, we also have some surprise guests that are pretty fun. And we recently uh, signed up a very, very nice musical guest, actually two musical guests. Uh, uh, one is a world famous musician. Well, actually, both of them are famous bands that have been around for a while. If you buy a VIP ticket, you actually get to go to the VIP conference, a concert. Uh, so I think there's just going to be a lot of value there. There's hackathons, workshops. Some of them are going to talk about zero knowledge proofs. Some are going to talk about Plutus. Uh, uh, some of them are going to talk about a lot of the engineering principles we use, uh, how to use Nix. Uh, there's going to be a crypto puzzle where uh, we're going to take uh, an ADA wallet, take the keywords and break them apart into four different puzzles. One will be on the t-shirt and three more throughout the conference hall. And the first person to break all four of those puzzles will get the ADA. And there you go. Uh, no purchase necessary. Uh, and uh, there's just uh, dozens of other little things like that. And there'll be some good sponsors and so forth. Uh, and it's also an opportunity to not just meet me, but meet literally everybody in my company. So if you ever want to meet Phil Wadler or Agalos or Duncan or Bruno or, you know, see some of the other people that make the magic happen, they're going to be there. And uh, in many cases, giving presentations and you can directly interact with them and uh, we can do some cool stuff together. Uh, so it's also the Merco people will be there and uh, the Cardano Foundation will be there. Uh, we partnered with Tangem and we're hoping that everybody who attends the conference will also get a free Tangem wallet. Uh, so that's a lot of value, and we'll just keep adding and adding and adding as the uh, weeks go on and more people get interested in attending. So I feel that the ticket prices are quite fair, and um, again, the hope is just simply for the tickets to recoup the investment of bringing all of our people together. This also gives us a chance to work towards something as a company, uh, and we'd like to show a lot of really cool accomplishments by the summit, or else it would be a pretty boring summit. So in many ways, the existence of a summit like this and the fact that we have that accountability of a deadline uh, kind of forces you to work under pressure and, and do your best work and get things out quicker. So it accelerates the launch of Shelly. It accelerates our competitiveness. It shows off all the things we've done. It, it'll help us to spell this myth that we're just a white paper and we're just a bunch of academics who have no idea how to ship anything. And it'll also allow us to make the case why Cardano is the best cryptocurrency in the world and why uh, we feel we have a good shot of, of getting to number one and getting, uh, getting the ecosystem to be uh, very dominant. Uh, and we're also going to fly out the Ethiopian class, all the gals who uh, have been training, uh, the ones who pass, will, uh, pending their visas getting cleared, will be able to come and do a presentation. So you can actually see firsthand the output of our education efforts in Africa and our entire enterprise team is going to be there. So if you're curious about how we're doing the blockchain side of things, uh, the summit will have those people there. So that's a lot of value for a $500 ticket. And um, I feel that uh, people are complaining about these prices. Either they don't go to cryptocurrency conferences and most of them are useless uh, or, they, uh, or they're just being a little stingy. And uh, you know, it's not to make money here. It's just to break even uh, and uh, also gives me a chance to bring all my people together. Uh, I miss them. And that's one of the tragedies of running a decentralized company. While it has a lot of benefits, the downside of running a decentralized company is that you don't get to see people that you've become friends with every day. You know, if I had a, just everybody who worked in the same office come in, I'd have my coffee and I'd be able to go door to door and say, hey, what are you working on? And, you know, and we'd be able to have a great conversation, go out to lunch, go get some drinks together. Uh, but Sometimes I'm a little isolated and I can just talk to them over Slack. Uh, so 
and I can't travel everywhere. I tried last year, I went to 30 countries. Uh, so bringing them all together for a big event is just great. And it's really heartwarming. And it means I finally get to see everybody again. Last time I did that was in Portugal in January of 2018. So it's, uh, it's simply been too long. Okay, let's see what we got here. How is Cardano attacking uh, interoperability, uh, cross-chain atomic swaps? Yeah, that's a good question. So interoperability needs to be uh, basically two things. First, you need to be able to move value between chains. And second, you need to move information between chains. So it would be nice that you can query Bitcoin and ask it, tell me your state. I need to know something about you. Uh, you know, what's, what's going on? What does this block look like? And you can get that information and know with reasonable degree of certainty that that feed of information you're getting is correct because there's events that happen everywhere in legacy financial systems and in the traditional crypto world that if you're running a smart contract might be event driven and it has to process all those events aggregate them and understand well, what does that mean for you and that could be a trading contract it could be like uh if this person dies uh you know give me the inheritance whatever it might be there's a there's a lot of little factors there so and when we say interoperability, generally we're either talking about I can move a token from one system to another system, or I can move information or understand information from one system to another system, either the outside world, another cryptocurrency, or the legacy business world. Uh, so everybody has an opinion on how to do this, and uh, opinions are like Wi-Fi. You know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and other protocols aren't necessarily the best protocols. They're just the ones that ended up winning and now everybody's using them. And there's probably at least one person in those spaces that said mine was better. And here are these objective, tangible, factual reasons why it's better. But just like in the VHS versus Betamax or the HD DVD versus Blu-ray or PlayStation versus Xbox, there's winners and losers in business and in standards. And at the end of the day, uh, somebody's going to win. And so the name of interoperability is be pragmatic. So whatever the standard is, support that, and we're going to do that. Uh, but it is probably a good idea to have a reasonable conversation about uh, proposing standards. So first off, there are two principal consensus algorithms used in the cryptocurrency world. There are others, but two are proof of stake and proof of work. So we have protocols to be interoperable with both classes of systems, the proof of stake side chains and the NEPIP house system. So we're going to be advocates of those protocols and we already are, and we're going around and saying, hey, uh, here's an improvement proposal. You all should adopt this. You get great light clients, and you get the ability to talk to each other. We'd love to see that happen. Now, there are other things. For example, there are DEXs, uh, for like Kyber, and they use atomic, they facilitate atomic cross-chain swaps so you can move value. Uh, there's also uh, protocols like Interledger, and there's even discussions about using the Lightning Network as kind of a universal layer two compatibility system between different ledgers. There's no reason why we can do that. So uh, we've assigned a product manager to look at Lightning and um, basically look at all the different proposals that exist. And we're in a really fortuitous situation where we have a natural set of nodes to run these types of things, namely the stake pools. So in addition to maintaining the state of ledger, they can also maintain these meta systems like Oracle services or Lightning nodes. And uh, we may be able to achieve interoperability through that layer. Um, they also, they can act as bridges for Interledger, which is a protocol from Ripple. And uh, we'll look at these things and, uh, you know, we'll probably roll them out as soon as Shelly and Gogan are out because we'll have enough capabilities in the ledger and it'll be fairly straightforward to do that. Now, closely related interoperability is a discussion about metadata. And this is really, really, really important. Uh, metadata is the is kind of like the secret sauce of your transactions. Uh, so for example, you have two events and they're the same value. So they're the same type of transaction. Bob withdraws $500 from his ATM. Now, doesn't matter, you know, it's Bob and an ATM, it's the same structural thing. It's going from one unit to another unit, pulling it out. One case, here's the metadata. Bob does it right next to a restaurant and it happens to be Christmas and uh, his family happens to be in town. Bob's taking the family out for dinner for Christmas. That's what you would infer from that event, more likely than not. The next case, 
Bob is pulling $500 out of an ATM at uh, a known brothel right next to it. Probably imagine Bob's doing something else. Now, this is the same type of transaction. It's Bob taking his $500 that he owns uh, and uh, just, just going with it. But the implications of that transaction are very different. So what does that mean? It means metadata in many cases is more important than the transaction itself. So well, how do we reconcile this? Well, one school of thought says metadata doesn't belong on the blockchain. Uh, and also it's very personal. It's very particular. And do we, uh, do, do we really want to live in a world where, you know, all this stuff is preserved forever? On the other hand, if you don't in some way represent the metadata of the transaction on the blockchain, well, then that means your metadata is no longer immutable, audible, and timestamped, in which case you can, you can move one set of metadata to another set of metadata. So you can make the family dinner look like the brothel if you wanted to. And whereas Bob may not have the ability to get recourse, so you can effectively deep fake the, uh, the uh, world into believing that you've done something that maybe you didn't do. Uh, for another example is the commercial intent behind a transaction. When I sent you money, it was usually because there was some sort of commercial understanding. It's a donation. It's a purchase for products. It's a trade for services. I give you this to mow my lawn. And again, the metadata is basically the story of why did I send you that money? So if blockchains are to be interoperable, they do have to for either compliance reasons, legal recourse, refunds, a litany of other commercial understandings have to have a metadata component. Because when you're moving value between ledgers, the metadata is going to flow with and oftentimes just as important. So what are we going to do with Cardano? Well, at the very least, what we're going to do is allow people to take the hash of the in commercial intent of the transaction and do contingent settlement transactions. So what the heck is that? Contingent settlement is where Alice sends something to Bob, but Bob doesn't get it until Bob agrees to the terms of service. So for example, let's say a donation. Alice is sending X amount of ADA to Bob to donate to his organization with some terms and conditions. I'll only give you this million dollars if you name uh, your, your science building after me for a university, for example. Okay, so she'll take that agreement, hash it, sign it, embed it into the transaction, send the agreement to send the transaction to Bob. It sits in pending, it's contingent. And then through a different band, probably PubSub, Bob will receive the agreement read it, agrees to it, hashes it, signs it, embeds it into the transaction. And only when both of those components are there does the transaction settle. So what does this mean? It means that now that Bob has the funds. So let's say he doesn't name the building. Then what Alice can do is go to the court and say, court, Bob agreed to do this. And she has a contract. She has his digital signature. And in now many, many, many jurisdictions, Wyoming now, uh, Alice has legal rights, and that's as good as it is. And that metadata has been timestamped. It's auditable. It's immutable. It lives there. Now, you can systematically construct from this basic primitive, arbitrarily complex financial arrangements, and in many cases, perhaps even automate these financial arrangements and have outsourceable servers that live off chain that coordinate things. So you can have a private part of the deal that only certain actors know, and then you have a public part which is preserved and that metadata is represented properly. Uh, so these capabilities will work their way into Cardano, and they don't quite take a lot of effort to do, and in, uh, they're easy to overlay, and they work very nicely with smart contracts, and instantly it allows you to now have a very elegant system to sign contracts and a very elegant system to tell the story of why you're sending money, what you're doing, what is this all about? And if we did install governance systems, like for example, you embed these types of transactions into those smart contracts I mentioned earlier, then that governance system would have something to work with. The arbitrators there would look at the metadata and say, yes, clearly you did receive this money to do X and there's no evidence that you did that. So we're gonna give Alice her refund. Okay, all right, let's look at the rest of the questions we got here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dumb.
Donald Obama. That's an odd name. I get this question a lot. In practice, how many Fortune 500 companies are using blockchain or uh, cryptocurrencies? Some are using blockchain. We talk to them, uh, but the majority are not using crypto, including JP Morgan Chase. They've decided to create their own coin. Uh, see, that's what we were saying a long time ago. All right, let's see what else we got here. Do, do, do. Is Rena still a thing or did we do a new approach? I was watching the old whiteboard video. You know, uh, whenever you set up an aggressive research agenda, you do a lot of high risk, high return research. And uh, what you do is you start for gold. You say, look, it'd be super cool uh, to, to get all of these things. And Rena was one of those high risk, high return uh, mega projects that basically we said, let's go shoot for it. Let's go try it and see how far we can get. So the Haskell team has kind of a, spiritual successor, like a, a micro version of Rena uh, that has a lot of the concepts and principles uh, of Rena embedded within it. And they're working their way towards that. And uh, there are certainly a lot of progress has been made. And the other problem with Rena is it's not 100% fit for perfect uh, purpose for a peer-to-peer -peer system. It requires some slight modifications with how diffs work. Uh, so we've done a heck of a lot of research and we thought about it. I asked uh, Neil and Peter and others in our company to give me an estimate of how much would it cost to do all of Rena the way that they wanted to do it. And their estimate was about $10 million and 600 man months of engineering. Uh, and that was a preliminary estimate, which was of course gonna be subject to your standard cost overruns and delays. So uh, what we did is we scaled Rena back a little bit and then we, we said, let's take the best concepts and ideas we think for a shorter time horizon, a one to three year horizon, and let's go chase those. And if we accomplish that, it puts us in a really good position for later generations of the protocol to move in that direction. Uh, Rena, in its grandest and most purest form would require special hardware. And that might make sense if we're talking about satellites. It may make sense if we're talking about mesh nets. So as ADA grows and we start trying to escape the regular internet and imagine a new, more fair internet, especially in places that are first getting it and getting it for the first time, it, it'll make a lot of sense to go in that particular direction. And because we have no loyalty to legacy protocols, it allows us to have a clean slate. Networking is among one of the most opinionated and complex issues because a lot of the times, the things that you want to do, you can't do. So what you have to do is basically play a game of, well, how do I do the least harmful thing to my user base? It's almost like, neurology or brain surgery. Uh, generally speaking, you don't make your patients healthier when you treat them. You're just slowing down the degeneration. When someone has Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or someone has a brain tumor, it's not exactly like you're gonna say, okay, here's this drug, I've cured your condition. Oh, it's more like I can give you an additional two or three years of meaningful life. Similarly, when you're dealing with networking, you can have these ideal, beautiful protocols that have lots of security and great properties, but they have to be deployable and live on the regular internet which is constrained and subject to older hardware, very older protocols, and uh, a lot of suboptimal design decisions that are provably bad and exploited on an often basis. So ton of complexity in the implementation of network protocols comes from heartening your protocols to defend yourself against the imperfections and mistakes of the original internet. Uh, and it's just a sad reality of where we're at. And that's why it's uh, so hard to innovate in this particular space and so frustrating to innovate in this space. And a lot of times when people care so deeply about performance and reliability, they build their own networks that are out of band and they don't go on the general internet. So um, we still have Rena on our heart and uh, we've learned a heck of a lot by pursuing it, but the grand Rena with the capital R uh, is probably not gonna work its way into Cardano in a 2020 horizon. Uh, but some variant of its concepts will, and it'll be sufficiently good, I think, to be a major innovation over how cryptocurrencies work. Um, if you look at the space, Protocol Labs has done good work with LibP2P, and there's been certainly a lot of discussion, like the Unit E guys are, a lot of them are network guys, so they're thinking a lot about how to improve network stacks. But unfortunately, this is an understudied area, and it's something that we badly need innovation in. Uh, because we're starting, when we bring these second generation or third generation scaling protocols in, we're going to reach massive theoretical bottlenecks, where our bottlenecks are no longer the consensus algorithm being bottlenecked, but rather 
being able to move the information between people. And if you have a homogeneous gossip protocol that's naively implemented, you're basically going to end up self DDoSing or something when you have too much flow and you need things like back pressure, hardening symmetry attacks and uh, protection from eclipse attacks and so forth. So working our way towards it. When bankrupt, never. When delisting, never. We're doing good, guys. Gotta love these trolls, though. Nostradamus, can you help the yellow vests in the French Revolution with smart contracts for them to vote? Population is asking for citizens' referendum. I think we can have millions of people adoption. You know, it's, uh, it's really tragic that we have people who want to express themselves in the world, and we still live in a world where there are a small group of actors who seem to control the global narrative about the intent and meaning behind what you do. Um, we'd like to believe we live in the time of the Enlightenment, and if you have an argument or you want to say this is what you intent and what you meant, uh, that you'd be listened to, people give you a fair shake. Unfortunately, what happens is that a protest occurs and the protesters are there for a reason, but then somebody decides to take that and put their own spin on it and say, well, this is what the protest was really about. Uh, in the United States, we had Occupy Wall Street. We also had the Tea Party before Occupy Wall Street. And uh, there were, in some cases, embedded within that movement, very, very legitimate grievances about the way society is structured and in many ways, it feels that it's just fundamentally unfair. And the yellow vests are no different in that respect. Uh, but what's unfortunately happened is the media has still has a huge amount of power to make these things seem like what they're not. Or in some cases, just completely bury these things. Uh, we had a populist uprising in 2009 in Iran that was so vicious, it actually nearly overthrew the government. Uh, we had uh, pro-democracy movements in Hong Kong, which were brutally shut down and um, people used mesh nets to communicate with each other. Uh, the same for Mubarak in uh, Egypt, and at least that one was successful. So it's not my job as a designer of protocols to take sides. I would be compromised and I would ultimately diminish my effectiveness in building these protocols. I must be like a judge. I must be dispassionate and neutral. It's my job, however, to build the best capabilities possible and make those capabilities as accessible as possible to everyone so that people can take those capabilities for whatever their particular movement happens to be, whether it's legitimate or not, that's for the rest of the society to decide, but it allows them to take it and at least be able to express themselves without fear of coercion, manipulation, reprisal, uh, or corruption of the message. And if people attempt to corrupt the message or to get retribution for it, that these tools also can allow society to see that front and center. Uh, so that's an idealistic dream. It's an idealistic goal, but it's, I think, something that is obtainable within my lifetime. So what does it mean? It means that we need to use the best processes and we need to use the, uh, the best available engineering uh, but at the end of the day, these things are only going to work if the general public uh, knows how to use them and decides to use them and thinks that they're important to use them. And that's a moral choice. And I can't make that for them. All I can do is build things. Um, I'd like to see within my lifetime a fundamental change in the incentives of journalism. I think they're fundamentally broken at the moment. The, journalism is not about reporting reality. And it's not about ensuring that people get a fair and accurate representation of what happened. Journalism is about creating hype and excitement and ultimately entertainment. Because at the end of the day, on a broadcast system, usually you have no power. You can't really do anything about it. So if you turn it into an interactive drama, at least people feel like they're part of the play, they're part of the show, even though they're just watching history move by. They're not making it. So we see interactions, headlines, stories, uh, fact-checking, all these things which are just not constructed in any way for productive dialogue. 
which actually why you see systems like the intellectual dark web be so prominent and powerful. Because at least there, instead of having these clickbait headlines and small blog posts that are, who cares if they're right or wrong, who cares what we say, there's no consequences, you have long debates which do not terminate with just one video. For example, Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris have been going at it and the uh, secular humanist movement have been going at it with Jordan Peterson about, well, is God useful and does God exist and should we believe in God? It's an interesting question. And uh, we see numerous debates and ev both sides are going at it, but they're going at it in a constructive way where they're actually not attacking each other personally. They're not going after, is Jordan a good person or Sam a good person? They're actually going after the crux of the argument. Uh, and we're actually making social and progress as a, co a consequence of these things. But not just for the nature of God, but also kind of things like policy. Should we have universal basic resources? Uh, you know, the, these types of conversations. And if that's not okay, well, then, uh, then what is the alternative? And will the alternative create a situation where all that collective wealth that's been created by those people and their companies could actually be compromised or destroyed, like what we saw in Venezuela? Uh, so these are tough questions, and they're very nuanced. They're multivariate. The Yellow Vest situation is just another reflection of that, and oftentimes those types of protests are symptoms of a broader problem where there's groups of society that are afraid the way things are going that they're going to ultimately be left out and put into a position where they're basically indentured servants to a system. They'll wake up every day, work hard, no matter what they do, what education they get, the content of their character or the quality of their merit, they're stuck in the mud. So imagine conceptually uh, if you were born and somebody just put a $5 million debt at a 5% interest rate on your head. No matter what you do, unless you get exceedingly lucky, like win the lottery uh, or you know you, you start a business and somehow that business ends up being crazy successful, more often than not, you're just basically permanently in debt. Now, if you could take that and say that there's a social component to that, and if you're put into a particular class or you live in a particular economy or environment, it's effectively the same deal. And uh, we see this in many different countries, like the United States. We have areas which have systemic poverty, the Appalachian Mountain Range. If you live in West Virginia and you come from like a coal mining area, or in Pennsylvania, it's the same way in certain areas, it is really hard to get ahead in life. Not many jobs, high unemployment rate, and the places where you can get a job pay less or are no longer hiring. So you don't have a lot of options. So either you leave, in which case you're leaving your family and your friends and the things that you know and love, or you stay and you accept a very, very bad job, uh, or you accept having to just scrape by. And as a consequence of spending everything you make, you actually get systematically poorer because wages are not increasing with inflation. Uh, so as a consequence, what does it mean? It means that you don't have the ability to create a savings and you're basically a slave to the system. And you're getting, your buying power is going down every year because of U.S. monetary policy. It's a bad deal. Now take that and replicate that to millions of people and you got a movement. And those people are going to have a voice and say, we want something better. And it's not good to just look at them and say, well, yeah, they, uh, they, if they just only got a college degree, that would somehow solve the problem. Or if they just only learned to program, that would just solve the problem. It's patronizing. And in many cases, it does nothing. Or it would require sacrifices, which uh, mean that they're able to get ahead at the expense of other people. Uh, so I see these movements, whether it be Occupy or Yellow Vest, as symptoms of broader social problems. And I see the frustration that people have in that the systems of communication we have and the narrative that the media propagates is not fit for purpose for us to actually have a discussion about how are we going to solve things. You know, my industry, this entire industry only exists as a consequence of the system, the legacy system being bankrupt. We're not the criminals. The whole reason we exist is because they are. Uh, you know, it, there's no greater example, a recent example of this than what JP Morgan has done. In 2017, the CEO says, Bitcoin is for criminals. It's a scam. It's a bad deal. And now they're launching their own token. And that's totally okay, and apparently that's fine. And uh, But yeah, there's no value in anything we do. But when they do it, it's fine. And let's just shut up and, and be patient and enjoy it. It's insulting, it's patronizing, and it's endemic of larger problems. 
So instead of saying, hey, <laughs> let's just let's just accept it and that w- that's the way life is, for the first time in human history, we have social tools, cryptocurrencies, and the derivative protocols of them to actually be able to do something about it. You don't like your money, make your own money. You don't like the way consent and voting works, build a different system. And uh, I think over time, this will have a huge impact and eventually topple society as it was and replace it with something a bit better. Do you think there's something better than proof of work or proof of stake to replace the current protocol? Well, there are certainly people that run around and they claim that they have the thing to solve all your problems. Like um, the latest two that I've seen are Avalanche and um, Hashgraph, where they say they're just so much better conceptually that you shouldn't even think about proof of work or proof of stake. You know, these things are just dead and dying and they ought not to exist. Um, First off, you have to think about the philosophy of what your consensus protocol is saying. The value of proof of work is that it is assembling lots of computational power. It's bringing a lot of computing power together. Now, the mistake of Bitcoin is that that computing power, because of the nature of the protocol, is effectively useless and always will be useless. It's ASIC optimizable, meaning that you can go do one thing and build special hardware to do that thing faster than everybody else. And it's just a game of doing that one thing over and over again. And it provides no value, no benefit to society other than the fact that you can do that one thing. That's a really bad way of doing things, but it was a necessary way of doing things to bootstrap the ecosystem. What's much more meaningful is saying uh, like the GPU or CPU based um, algorithm where because of some design of it, the only way you can do that thing is to use a general purpose computer then you're doing two things now. Instead of just saying we're solving problems, you're also saying, oh, by the way, I've just built a grid computer with hundreds of thousands of machines that have a lot of capacity to work on general problems like folding proteins, uh, like storing data and verifying that you possess that data. Uh, You know, things like searching the stars for alien life, whatever that might be. So the next generation of proof of work will be less about, uh, you know, how do we achieve, uh, you know, more optimal ASIC. And it's going to be a lot more about saying, let's better use the fact that we've aggregated all this raw computational capacity, which will auto upgrade because it's consumer hardware uh, without having to pay for that upgrade. And let's now steer this computational capacity in a productive direction. We've seen some flirting with these ideas with things like PrimeCoin that was the very first example and later papers like Permacoin and a paper out of Berkeley called Useful Proof of Work. And my hope is the proof of work system will move in that particular direction. Um, In addition to getting rid of the mining pool monopolies and um, also, uh, you know, embracing quality DAG stuff and so forth. In terms of concepts like throughput and latency, uh, the protocols have evolved to a point where throughput can be considerably increased. So you, know, you can get things that are tens of thousands of TPS if you really want to, and the trade-off profile is increasingly getting more reasonable. And then confirmation latency will get better as well over time. And then we wrote a paper on the relationship between the two and some theoretical maximums of what you can and can't do. Proof of stick is a fundamentally different system. It found a way to replicate the lottery of proof of work, but doesn't require computational capacity. And actually, I'll tell you one of my proudest moments in my career uh, in the entire cryptocurrency space. It came very recently, and it's something I'll mention at the IOHK Summit. And uh, boy, it's it's really magical. Um, I was talking to Marcus, and um, Marcus had uh, told me that he's trying to get uh, a stake pool to work on a RockPi board. Now, RockPi is it sells is R O C K P I. Uh, and it sells for like $70. It's a very low cost device and it only uses a few watts of power, like four watts of power. And if uh, once once we have this test net out, we'll try to compile it and run it and we'll work really closely with them because I'd love to do this. But here's the long and short. One of these little boards, which is basically the size of a cell phone, kind of actually looks like this calendar. This is about how big it would be. 
um, with everything in it. One of these little boards, four watts of power, can run a stake pool. And if that's the case, you'd only need a thousand of them to run a thousand stake pools. So you're running an entire system, a global scale financial system, five kilowatts of electricity. That heater right there uses about 1.5. So I just need a few of those. And I can run a global scale system that's 100 times more decentralized than Bitcoin, 30 times the throughput, uh, confirmation times 15 times faster. Think about that. Five kilowatts. That's about 20 solar panels if you're doing those 250 watt solar panels. You could power a global scale financial system. And it'll get more power efficient over time. It's unbelievable that you could build a system like that and uh, have it work and... That's a consequence of good protocols and that's a consequence of good science. And it's uh, humbling to think that that's how far we've gone in just such a short period of time and very quickly we'll converge there. So anyway, proof of stake is less about power consumption. It's as low as it's gonna get, five kilowatts is nothing. It's now about talking about who should be in control. So what proof of work does is it punts and it's just a meritocracy, it's an exogenous system, it lives outside of your system and whoever the hell can figure out ASICs and subsidized power and that, that very weird, sharky, predatory game, they're your masters and just accept that they're smarter than you and they're in control. And once they get in control, it's usually an aristocracy and they're, uh, they're in that game. And unless you're very rich, hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars and great connections, you're just not going to be in that club. So don't even think about it. And they're total control of the whole thing. Whereas, uh, whereas proof of stake, you know, that's basically saying, well, now, no matter who you are, if you own a few sh units of the system, you're going to have some influence over it. Not a lot, but some. And that's proportional to your amount of ownership in the system. But we can augment that eventually as the systems evolve with other factors. Like we can layer in not just your ownership of a token, but also, are you providing resources? Are you a valued member of this ecosystem? Like if we're in a liquid democracy system, and you're a delegate for lots of votes, maybe you get a better chance of winning to get a block. And that's measurable within the system. If you're providing a lot of bandwidth to people or storage, maybe you get a little bit more chance to win. So we're just at the infancy of a very long conversation, which will take years to decades to work our way through about you biasing the proof of stake model to include more than just the raw ownership of the asset. And what this effectively means is we're not just talking about consensus, we're talking about your value in the system, whether you're a good actor or a bad actor, according to some collection of metrics that we've determined are good. And that's Darwinian. Some people will get it right, some people won't, but it's a really exciting time. And ultimately I think that proof of stake will overcome proof of work as a dominant consensus system. Proof of work will still be valuable, but it's gonna change the way it works. It's more about saying, I want to build a decentralized grid computer a la folding at home, and I am using a system to bring these types of nodes together. Proof of stake is hitting the crux of the who decides and who pays and who's valuable and who's not, and how do we empower people and hold people accountable for the decisions they've made. Now, the very same mechanisms that you could use for that, you could also apply to platforms. For example, if you're uh, the Sargon issue with Patreon or the deplatforming of conservative people on Twitter or uh, YouTube, wherever you fall in that political spectrum, this is an issue where you have these systems where we build them, we make them, we make Twitter, we make Facebook. Many people come together and create the product. And there is no product without us, but then you have an unelected dictatorship that basically decides the rules of the game and can change them arbitrarily, including destroy your entirely livelihood arbitrarily based upon their political whims and wills with no oversight or checks or balances. That model will die. That model must die. We kill kings. We kill dictators. Humans have moved beyond that. And uh, we look at kings and dictators as terrible things. We should never regress back into that for the sake of expediency or necessity for how we get our news, how we interact with people, or who has legitimate opinions or not. So they have to go. But what do you replace it with? Well, we're talking about a system where we're trying to decide who's 
good to interact with and who's bad to interact with, what's correct good behavior, what's not so good behavior. So the same concepts that allow you to determine that for who should be in charge of running the chain can also be potentially reused to say what is good information versus what is bad information. And you can collectively reach a decision about good members or bad members without having a leader at the top. It's just an organic process that occurs. That is where we're going with this type of technology. This is what we're thinking about with this type of technology and something that makes me profoundly excited because I think that this is a problem that can be solved in the next 10 years. And what this effectively means is it will kill the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Reddits and these other platforms and replace them with infrastructure that is a public good, that is self-sustaining, that allows people to express themselves in the ways that they want without fear of reprisal. Now, another thing that it really is interesting is closely related to this concept of control and value is this idea of penalties. You know, if I pollute, there are a lot of countries in the world that think it's a good idea to just say, it's a lot, you're allowed to do that as long as you buy carbon credits or as long as you buy some indulgences. And the Catholic Church many, many years ago, and pay for the Crusades, decided to create a system where you're allowed to sin and but you could buy your way into heaven if you just paid the right priests off. Uh, you know, so there's all throughout human history this notion that sometimes we behave badly, and if we pay a fine, uh, we we are allowed to recover from that bad event. Now we run into this terrible problem that social infractions, for example, of uh, the the Moore memo or other things, where you know some people believe that people have said or behaved badly, they've done something that's socially irresponsible, instead of just saying, say you're sorry and we'll move on, there's a group of people who think that there's no way to come back from that. And the only way to solve the problem is by destroying that person's life, deplatforming them, robbing them of their economic livelihood, firing them from their job, making them a social pariah. And there is no forgiveness, none. I mean, maybe 20 years in the future, you can crawl back and beg for table scraps. But no, it's total destruction, total burn the person down. Isn't it an interesting thing that we could one day potentially have a system where you could behave badly, you could maybe be a little sexist, maybe say offensive things, and if you're caught doing that, you, there's a tokenization of these things, and you could pay a penance, a social token, and that gets you back into good graces, and it allows you to become a proper member of society again. And if you consistently behave badly, you go socially bankrupt, and then you get kind of isolated off. But um, if you... Uh, you know, only occasionally do it, but you can recover a little bit. And then everybody just kind of looks the other way and they say, well, he paid the price. Um, this is not only a hypothetical, it's actually being thought about by governments and institutions, for example, social credit in China. And this carries very profound implications, uh, both negative and positive, for the gamification of human behavior and for also our ability to say that certain members of society are productive, good members of society. Uh, we all tend to sometimes break the rules, sometimes we speed, sometimes people don't pay for a train because it's only one stop and it's late at night. Uh, you know, these things happen and uh, does it doesn't necessarily mean that people are bad actors. Interesting question. Now, cryptocurrencies are also on the forefront of that because at the end of the day, they're incentive engines. They allow you to create value and distribute that value amongst people and decide who ought to get it, who will not get it. It's an interesting concept. So, Proof of stake is at the heart of all of that because it creates a foundation of research, a corpus of research, which ultimately can be repurposed for all of these things. Whether we're talking about a social credit system or a penance system for indulgences, uh, or we're talking about carbon reduction, or we're talking about incentives to clean up the oceans, uh, or we're just talking about who should we listen to in an information stream without a nominating a dictator and having that dictator have total control over our lives. It's pretty interesting. Okay, what else do we got? <clears throat> and if you haven't figured out by now, I tend to give people very long answers that go in different directions. Some people truly hate this, and some people really like this. And I like to believe that the people that really hate this have already left the ecosystem and they are, uh, they are now happy purchasers of EOS and Tron. People hate it when I do that too. 
<laughs> some people like that. Where are we going with this? Come on, guys. I'm looking for an interesting question. Something with lots of meat that people find interesting. Well, hello from Turkey. What area, Turkey? It's a beautiful place. And Nipah Pals versus Mimble Wimble. Well, they accomplish different things, but even if they did the same thing, Nipah Pals are awesome, and I think they're better because we invented it. Hi, Charles. Can you speak more about the coffee smart contract case in Ethiopia? Oh, sure. That's going to be a fun one. And uh, you know, what's the what's the end goal? Where, where do we want to go? Okay, so let's say you go to Starbucks and you have your cup of coffee. And it has, a, and this is 20 years in the future, like far in the future. You always have to start with the end in mind and kind of work your way backwards. Stephen Colby did that in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He said, start with the end in mind. If you die, what will people say at your funeral? Okay. So we have our cup of coffee, and I have my cell phone right here, and I scan the QR code. Now, what, what just happened? I get some information on my app, and it basically tells me, what's the story of that cup of coffee? We don't think about stories with fungible goods and products. When you see one bar of gold versus another bar of gold, you don't particularly care what the story is. It's gold. You have your cup of coffee, it's coffee. But what's happened is as a society, we've moved to an evolved state and say, look, we live in an algorithm-rich, data-rich environment. And as a consequence, we can now actually talk about where the beans in that coffee came from and then give that information to the consumer. And what does this mean? It means that you as the consumer now have for the first time ever, the ability to understand if those beans meet your values. And you say, oh, you're just being a liberal flu flu, uh, you know, only, only bearded hipsters from Boulder care about that. Okay, well, what if you find out that those coffee beans were harvested by slaves, people who were actually held at gunpoint and forced to harvest them? Would that be okay? A lot of people say no. What if you find out that those coffee trees come from a region where to plant those trees and maintain those trees, it caused dozens of indigenous species to go extinct. Giraffes and other things, they just died out because they harvested that farmland. Would you be okay with that? Some people, yes, no. Okay. So the point isn't to say, well, this is good or bad by an entity like a government. The point is rather saying by tracking these things, you as a consumer get to make some decisions. Now, we're already starting to do that. And we're doing it in a very crude, ham-fisted way, and it's a little dishonesty. Like, for example, organic or vegan-friendly or these types of things. They'll put labels on and, and, and the, you know, maybe there's regulation, maybe there's not, or non-GMO. That's another thing. The point is that systems are being built today for the purposes of fair trade, carbon reduction, sustainable farming practices, whatever they may be that will inevitably allow us 20 years in the future to be able to scan that cup of coffee and understand the story behind that product. And the hope is then that you, the consumer, getting that information can now be a more discriminating consumer. You're already a discriminating consumer when you look at two products and one says made in China and the other says made in Japan or made in Germany or made in USA. Just by stereotypes and brand bias, you'll think that the Chinese product probably is inferior to the German product or the Japanese product or the American product. Because you say, well, Chinese goods tend to be math manufactured and made at a very low cost. So, you know, it, all things considered, maybe the German product is better. Now, that might not actually be true, but you believe that because of biases and stereotypes you have. When you go to a big data world, instead of going into the aggregate and just believing something because that's your mental model, you actually can go into the particular for the first time ever. Okay, so that's the abstract. Now let's go to the particular. Let's actually talk about what we're doing in Ethiopia. So what we're doing in Ethiopia is we have a three-part model for how we do government contracting. Part one is where we enter a jurisdiction and partner with the ministry. 
usually science and technology or education, you know, something that has a techie feel to it because they control the universities or are connected to the university. pilots and hire locals to run those pilots to look at verticals like ag tech, for example. We're very obsessed with that in Ethiopia, coffee. And we'd like to train a bunch of people and teach them what is a blockchain, how to be a good programmer, how to use our tech that we're building, uh, and also just how to think around how to build these types of applications. Okay. And they always say yes. They say, you want to train people and hire them and give them nice high paying jobs. Oh, yes. No, no, please don't do that. No, they always say yes. So they say, okay, let's do that. Then uh, we build a class in negotiation with them, and uh, we send out our best and brightest that we have, the best we have can offer. Lars Munoz, he's a brilliant guy. We sent out Paulina as well. She's great. Uh, and they, uh, they go there and they say, we're going to teach these people uh, Haskell or something. And that's a great way of filtering the class. Should they pass it, then we know they're rigorous, they're good candidates, and we hire them. If they can pass, we hire them. So in the moment, we have 23 people, all women, in Ethiopia, 19 from Ethiopia, four from Uganda. Uh, and uh, the class is about halfway through and we see some great, very encouraging progress. And I hope they all pass, but the standard's the standard. We don't discriminate by gender or race or uh, culture. We, we say this is the standard and they have to measure up. And if they measure up, we hire them. Okay, then stage two, we go and do pilot. So you crawl out of Ethiopia and you say, all right, let's look at a particular region where it'd be really cool to build out a supply chain. And what does that mean? It means that we find an area where we can model from start to finish, from the farmer's trees to the donkey that they put those beans on the back, to the washing stations, to all the logistic networks that get it to the central exchanges to sell it. We can model that whole thing out. Then once we model this whole thing out, then we say, how do we identify each person in that chain? Then after we identify each person, what is the metadata about it and what types of transactions? And we might even write a DSL to actually model and describe all of these types of things. Then how do we get information into the system? And then how do we incentivize information to enter the system? And that can be through um, group loans. Like if you do this, you get money for stumping. That can be that you get higher prices on your uh, beans and we can subsidize that through many models. It's, it's a complicated affair. But anyway, basically the pilot kind of figures these things out. Then once that model is built, and you'll notice that we have locals who are interfacing with the people. So they understand the culture, they speak the language, but then we also have our engineers working with them as well. So both sides are doing some great things. That pilot then constitutes a feasibility analysis to scale this across the entire vertical. So if it works there, we'll try to take it to all million and a half coffee farmers. Now, how do we deploy it to them? If we have a sustainable model, we set up a company. A subsidiary and it's a partially owned subsidiary we give the government some of the equity the employees on the ground some of the equity we might even make it a co-op where we give the farmers some of the equity so it's owned by the people in addition to us and we can offset the cost of deploying to all a million and a half through venture capital through impact funding through international grants so we can go to the government and say we roll a whole system and you don't pay anything up front and then every time something enters the supply chain or the supply chain is used you have to pay a small toll for that which is affordable but in aggregate, you're talking about millions and millions and eventually billions of transactions, and that sums up the hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue with something that'll eventually run the entire market. So it becomes a hyper-profitable, franchisable, white labelable piece of infrastructure that I can take and put across the entire vertical in different countries. Now, what else have we done? Well, I just didn't build a supply chain. I took a million and a half people and I gave them cryptocurrency wallets. I gave them the ability to transact and manage private keys. And that ledger, because I built it, is going to be interoperable with Cardano, which means I just brought a million and a half users into Cardano. That's why I don't give a shit about partnerships and these other things, because at the end of the day, we're not going to win in the Western world to begin. It's a rigged system, guys. JP Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs and these other guys, they've already won. They've already rigged it. And if it becomes a big deal, you don't think Amazon and Facebook and Google and Microsoft aren't going to come and play with their billions of users? What the hell is it going to do for me when Microsoft coins built into Windows and they have 2 billion users? Or Facebook coins built into Facebook wallet, into the messenger, and they got a billion and a half users, and it's a cloud application, so they have a great user experience with that. It works on mobile. I'm not going to win that fight. But guess what? I can win the Africa fight. And by aggregate, 
that gives me half a billion users to a billion users, and it carries our values. It's decentralized, it's free and fair, and it's helping some of the poorest people in the world create wealth and rise up. And what does that mean? It means that then that gives me collective negotiating power to actually get reasonable regulation. Because I say, if you want to be interoperable with my system and make trillions of dollars working with these people who are about to become wealthy, you have to be fair. So you have to think about self-sovereign identity and you have to protect people's privacy and you have to give them control over their assets. They have collective bargaining power. So instead of just accepting the dictatorships of these, these tyrannical companies, we can now actually create be much better, more efficient systems and kill the middlemen of necessity. We can burn their companies to the ground and replace them with things that are owned by all of us. Open protocols, open systems, no middlemen. Now there's still room for entrepreneurship, but then that means the only way you make money is if you do something, you create something. You don't make money by rushing your way to a monopoly and then making a deal with the government to preserve your monopoly and stop so starting to go towards. I'm not comfortable with it. I think it's a dark road to go down. So I'm going to go to Africa. I'm going to go to Asia and I'm going to win there. And there's billions of people there. And there's trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of wealth there. And by the way, if you're talking about cryptocurrency adoption, who buys cryptocurrencies? Who uses cryptocurrencies? Young people. And where are the youngest people in the world? 70% of Ethiopia is under the age of 30. And the vast majority of those people are internet able and have heard and in some cases used cryptocurrencies and are used to the idea of mobile money and grew up in a monetary system where the government money sucks. And they've had to do things about that already. So when you go and make the case that cryptocurrencies are a better system, would you rather be selling it to 55-year-old pensioners that listen to Fox News? Or would you rather be selling it to the people that are actively looking for an alternative? And by the way, their economy is growing at 10% per year. Think about that. You know, so that's the key. And then once you get these people in, you're in a position to negotiate and you can negotiate with leverage. The dumbest thing you can do in the world is go and say, give me X when you have no leverage for X. It's like asking for a raise to your boss. If you are fungible, expendable, you produce nothing of true value and you're just kind of there, you're like the door greeter at some store and you, whether you're there or not, the business runs. You can't go to your boss and say, give me a 50% raise or I walk. They say, Bobby, it's been nice having you here, but maybe it's time for you to retire. But if you happen to be in a key role of your company, you happen to be, if you walk out the door, they lose millions or billions of dollars. You've got a lot of leverage. So would you rather go to the US government or the European Union and say, guys, uh, you don't do business with us, you lose $5 trillion, or you're gonna be pushed into a financial collapse. So let's talk about how we're gonna do business in a fair way for the world. Or would you rather go and say, out of the grace and goodwill of your heart, can you please, please, please help me? Can you, can you please, please, please do things the honest, moral, right way? What position would you rather be in? You asking for the same thing. And that's the key. You see, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to the with a pan-African strategy and go to Asia, and we're going to build up a way of getting millions, eventually tens of millions, eventually hundreds of millions into our system through enterprise public-private partnerships that make systems better. There's international desire to build these systems for carbon reduction, fair trade practices, and sustainable farming. A lot of money available through direct foreign investment, impact funding, and the governments themselves. And the infrastructure is about ready to do it. We're going to go do that. We're going to go put it in. And then once we're there, we're in a real great position to collectively bargain and make sure that regulation doesn't go insane. I do not want to live in a world where you have to have an escrow of all your private keys and give that to the government. I do not want to live in a world that to use Bitcoin, you have to be a licensed money service business and get a million dollars worth of licenses. I do not want to live in a world where at any given time, usage of a system to express your opinion may result in you losing social credit and then eventually being exiled from society. Just don't want to. And the things that will push the world in this direction are tyrannical, centralized, hierarchical co companies that are preserving their power. And if we do nothing, the default state will be to move in this particular direction. The only way we can prevent that is to depower these structures. And the only way we can do that is through leverage. And this is how you create it. Okay, so 
that's what we're going to do. That's that's our strategy. If you don't like it, there's 2,000 plus cryptocurrencies in the world, and there's lots of other companies doing interesting things. And uh, you know, go buy XRP. They're, they're they're playing in the Western world, and they're the Ned Flanders of cryptocurrencies. If the regulator says spy on your customers, they'll find a way to do it. Uh, but for me, I have principles and values, and um, I just wear them on my sleeve. And some people hate me for them, and some people love me for them. And that's uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, Craig Wright, I've got more money than your African country. I ever tell you guys the story of that? You know, I, I was in Rwanda, and um, I knew that somebody from his company was going to speak on a panel that I was on, but he wasn't on the agenda, so I didn't know he was there. I find out I'm on a panel with Craig Wright like an hour before I go on the panel. And uh, I'd never met him. I just knew of him. And a very distasteful guy. So fuck it. Why not uh, Why not go and talk to him? Okay. So we're in the back room getting ready for the panel. And Craig comes on in. He's got his phone. And he's looking at it like this. And the guy's trying to brief us all about how the panel is going to be. And every about minute, he just lifts his head and yells at that guy says no you're wrong and i'm right i have more money than you and i'm right and the other guys were all just looking at each other like who the hell is this guy jesus christ you know did he not take his wheat did he not eat his wheaties this morning i mean what's going on so uh so i i told the moderator i really don't want to speak on this panel and they say no you have to the president of rwanda's here you know it's a big government event uh, it would be irresponsible to bow and i said all right well I'll go do my speech and I'll sit on the panel, but when he speaks, I'll walk out. So I, I did my speech and uh, when he spoke, I walked out of the room and then we were on the panel and and it was just amazing the answers that I saw to some questions and the mentality that this guy had. I control everything. I'm smarter than all of you. I patent everything. Um, the good news about the cryptocurrency space is that over time, over the years, not necessarily the days or weeks, we seem to be pretty good at eventually exposing and uh, riding out these types of people and increasingly isolating them. And I hope that um, that's what happens in his particular case. Um, if that is how we're going to go and what our party's all about, um, I don't want any part in it. I don't think it's really going to accomplish anything. I'd rather just go work for DARPA. You know, at least you, at least you get to see something you want there. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Sorry for the tangent, but I just really do not like that guy. And I'm sure he doesn't like me. I ran him into a Yokohama and he gave me a pretty big scowl. And he says I'm a scam artist. But, you know, Dan says that too. And I'm going to F Denver tomorrow. So we'll see what they say. There's thousands of Ethereum people and I'll kind of walk in and, and uh, we'll see if these keyboard warriors will say to my face what they tell me over Twitter. Hey, Charlie, if you work for a company, you would have been fired long ago. There are deadlines to meet. You can't take forever with any project. Let's talk about deadline. We get criticized all the time for that. This, this is going to be fun. Y'all ready for another Charles rant? Everybody, everybody fired up for that. <laughs> um, here's the thing. You know, let's talk about the Microsoft HoloLens. And let's talk about Natal and research. Um, if you came to me and you said, hey, I got a great idea for a product. It weighs a lot. It gets really heavy it, you know, after you wear it for a few hours. It gets hot, $3,000. It's got a short battery life. And this augmented reality headset, it's got a field of view like this. And, uh, and boy, am I not doing a great job. You know, if you, you try to ship that as a production consumer product and expose that to the general public, so it would be the biggest flop of all time and, and you'd just be laughed out of industry. So why is the HoloLens not labeled as this extraordinary failure and Microsoft is, is yet again incompetent and uh, this company, uh, you know, just a wannabe and they're not real? Well, because we all understand that that